Much love and respect. Pura vida, mi gente. Thanks for tuning in once again. Really appreciate you guys taking the time to do that. Today, we're just going to read a little bit, have a little more context when we talk about Andrew Jackson. You know, we know a certain history of him. We're going to read something about his uh, youth and his life that most people don't really know. Uh, his relationship, good and bad, with the uh, American Indians. We're going to read a dissertation here. We're going to get into the first chapter of this dissertation. Right now, we're at the University of Alabama, all right, University Libraries. And it says here, Andrew Jackson and the Indians, 1767 to 1815. Um, well, the abstract says, Andrew Jackson's experience with the Indians was an ambivalent relationship from his childhood along the South Carolina, North Carolina border through his two terms as president. He had extensive interaction with both friendly and enemy Indians, all right? So he wasn't just an enemy, he also had friendly uh, Indian tribes. As a child in South Carolina, Jackson grew up around the peaceful Catawba Indians. Did you guys know that? During the American War for Independence, he served as a scout alongside the Catawbas as members of his community fought the British and their Indian allies from the West most notably the Cherokees, all right? So, I mean, it keeps going, but basically we're gonna get into the article. When you go ahead and click on this right here, it brings you to the actual article. Now, before I begin, I also wanna just say this, you know, I might have a lot of new people or anyone watching my channel or my information for the first time, I might say certain things that you not agree with, but, you know, this is a modern article we're gonna read. They're gonna add some hijacks here and there. That's why you got to know how to dodge the hijacks. They might mention the word African or Negroes and Blacks. You know, when they're saying Blacks or slaves, that doesn't automatically mean African. And because they say Africans, that doesn't mean that the actual primary sources they're quoting, when you actually go read that primary source, it actually says Africans. A lot of the time it just says slaves or Negroes. And, you know, modern interpreters will switch that into African when we're reading these articles. So you got to dodge the hijack big time. You got to remember there was Negro Europeans, so-called black Europeans and the Indians. Many of them, most of them would be considered Negroes. You know, the ones that were in that time. Remember the de definition of the American, right? Of the word American, the 1828 Webster's Dictionary is referred to Americans or the Indians as the copper colored tribes of America. Many shades from light copper to the darkest copper and all the shades in between. Not just one shade, not one color, but many. But yeah, in general, a lot of melanated people in the Americas before Europeans arrived and these Europeans were melanated. As we're reading this article, guys, remember all this stuff. It's also going to talk about, you know, the Catawbas and Cherokees. So if any of you are Catawbas or Cherokees, you know, don't take any of this personal. This ain't about picking sides. We just got to have a full context of conflicts and history and not just receive a one-sided version of history like we receive in school. 
a lot of us know only about the five civilized tribes and and what Andrew Jackson did, you know, when when it comes to the Indian Removal Act, but not any history before that, who he was, context, who he dealt with, how much did he hate all Indians, or was it a specific Indian people or tribe or confederacy that he didn't like? So that's what we're going to get into when, as we're reading this article. Uh, it's probably going to be like three or four parts. Just want you guys have a little background and context and be ready to dodge any hijacks. I'll go ahead and explain while, while I'm reading. If you're new to my channel, please catch up on my videos. I have over 870 presentations. We've already debunked the out of Africa theories. We've already debunked the West African slave trade. There was a middle passage, but it wasn't coming from West Africa. That's why I'm always saying, make sure to check out my previous videos, check out my playlist, my series, which is called the real slave trade. I break it down. They were enslaving American Indians heavily, heavily, not a little bit heavily. And these, a lot of these Indians were labeled as Negroes and Africans in history. Part two shows the middle patches coming from Europe, thousands, hundreds of thousands, hundreds of thousands coming into the plantations from Europe, not Africa. Then part three shows the Asian slaves. This is what they look like. Then commercial Indian slaving and the development of colonial North America. All right. And so on and so on. A lot of videos for you guys to check out. A lot of history you're missing. Make sure to catch up and also Try to watch the presentation all the way to the end and apply all the stuff we've learned before. And again, Andrew Jackson and the Indians by Jonathan Ray, Tony Freyer, committee chair, David Badel, Larry Clayton, Howard Jones, Gregory Wasselkopf, a dissertation submitted in partial fulfillment of the requirements for the degree of Doctor of Philosophy in the Department of History in the Graduate School of the University of Alabama. Tuscaloosa, Alabama, 2014. So we're going to go into chapter one of this dissertation. This will be part one of this uh, series, I guess. We're probably going to read every chapter. So chapter one says, Jackson and the Indians in backcountry South Carolina to the American Revolution. Andrew Jackson learned the value of Indian allies and the danger of hostile tribes during his childhood and teenage years through his community in the wax house of South Carolina. There were two Indian tribes in the Carolinas of his youth, the Cherokees and the Catawbas. The Catawbas were a peaceful tribe, listen, that lived among Jackson and the Waxhaw residents. The Cherokees, on the other hand, had attacked back country South Carolina, listen, during the French and Indian War and did so again during the American Revolution. They're saying about people's feelings getting hurt who's better or my tribe is better than your tribe but i'm just trying to tell you this is real history there was a time when you know the Catawas were living uh peacefully many times when the cherokees were uh invading them attacking them taking their people you know given the violence of the back country jackson's learned animosity towards some indians not all indians okay towards some indians became more understandable so remember, now he's portrayed as an enemy of the Indians, but it was a specific type of Indians he had relocated. He did have peaceful negotiations with certain tribes, and we're going to get a more, little bit more context between what happened, all right, with the whole Indian removal, maybe when we read uh, this whole article. So again, a lot of violence going on at this time, and, you know, that's what he's going through. He's in between. He's, he's, he's in the middle of both sides. Nevertheless, his understanding of the difference between those Indians who were cooperative and those who wanted to harm him, serve him well, as he grew up along the South Carolina, North Carolina frontier border preceding the American Revolution. Much of the Jackson historiography either neglects or marginalizes the different experiences between the Cherokees and the Catawbas. All right, this is a little a bit of history. People don't really know, understand. They don't have no context of this part of Andrew Jackson's history. Remember, they vilify and make heroes of who they want in history, right? It doesn't change ever. Apply that always. There's always a story to everybody. So again, they're telling you right here, not me and all these people in the University of Alabama 
they telling you they neglect marginalize this experience of the uh, Cherokees and the Catawbas who though small in number were a part of the Waxhaw community so the Waxhaws are related to the Catawbas their eastern Siouan tribes Jackson's early view of Indians emerges in an interview with Susan Alexander who knew Jackson as a young boy along the Carolinas border the Alexander interview given to a leading newspaper the National Intelligencer occurred in 1845 the year of Jackson's death Alexander described Jackson and his family during the American Revolution in which the Jacksons and their relatives, the Crawfords, fled British, Tory, and Cherokee aggression in their home of the Waxhaws in South Carolina. They lived with the Waxhaws, listen, and crossed the border into North Carolina. Alexander's interview was most famous because of her description of young Jackson and his mother's view of the Indians. She described Betty Jackson as being a dreadful enmity with the Indians. Alexander used the term Indians without making distinctions among the Indian enemies of the colonists during the War for Independence, in which the British used many Indian allies. Specifically, listen who the British were allying with, who were allies with the British, listen, the Cherokees, Creeks, Chickasaws, and Choctaws in the South almost like the five civilized tribes, right? They were allies with the British and the Americans were allies with some other tribes like the Catawba and other ones, right? Her account did not acknowledge that the Catawba Indians closest to Jackson's childhood home remained allies of the American revolutionaries throughout the war. All right? Alexander's interview failed to capture the nuances and in Indian relations that the residents of the Waxhaws experienced prior to and during the revolution. Most Carolinians lived in fear of the Cherokees, in part because of atrocities committed against so-called whites or Europeans. The, these same Carolinians recognize, however, the importance of making Indian alliances whenever possible. Alexander speaking just months, months after the war's hero's death portrayed Jackson as a man who grew up fighting Indians on the frontier rather than a man who understood the complexity of the early settler Indian relations. The same men who hated the Cherokees initially sought their alliance, but after being rejected, they relied on the Catawbas as allies throughout the war. The hatred Carolinians such as Alexander and Elizabeth Jackson shared did not necessarily indicate enmity against all Indians. Rather, all right, it wasn't about, you know, fighting with all Indians. Rather, they directed their anger at the Cherokees specifically and other British Indian allies. Whoever was an ally of the British, whatever tribe, this, this is who Jackson and the Jackson family kind of didn't like, hate it, you know, had relocated. <laughs> so in the South, who were principal enemy during wartime and a terror threat in peace. Meanwhile, they developed a respect for the Catawbas, who rejected British entreaties to attack colonists and then fought alongside their European neighbors, not white, but European neighbors. Not only fought, but they mixed with them, just like the British were mixing with a lot of the Cherokees, Creeks, and, you know, they weren't just allying. Jackson and the Waxhaws, it says here. Andrew Jackson Sr., came to America from Ireland in 1765 to escape poverty. The Jacksons arrived shortly after the French and Indian War in which Cherokees had joined the French in terrorizing the British and colonists in the Carolina backcountry. All right, this is what they were doing. Because of the violence, the British implemented the Proclamation of 1763, which separated colonists from the Indians. Britain also enticed poor Protestants to settle backcountry to bolster the white numbers or European numbers along the Indian frontier. Jackson's father, along with most other immigrants to the Carolinas, came for the inexpensive land. Jackson was born amid these struggles. The elder Jackson was very poor in Ireland and did not fare much better in his short time in America. And uh, most likely if he was very poor, how would he pay his passage, guys? He would have to indenture himself. He might have been an indentured servant. And I think we have gone over that uh, before. South Carolina drew Irish, 
European Protestants to the colony in 1761 by offering them free land, tax exemptions, and free tools to offset the growing um, a slave population. It starts to hijack as they say in Africa. So why would they even mention that? A bounty act of 1761 brought roughly 500 immigrants to the South Carolina backcountry, including the Jackson family, by 1765. So a bounty act, huh? The total Piedmont uh, European and so-called black, they're saying white and black, we don't know who these people are. They could be European, Indian, they could be anything, you know, so we can't go off these classifications. Increased 50% in fi five years. The white population of the Europeans a few miles across the border in Western North Carolina increased 229% between 1755 and 1767. The immigrants of Jackson's senior generation escaped harsh conditions in Ireland by emigrating to an isolated, impoverished community. They were not only extremely poor, but also vulnerable to drought and crop failure. In South Carolina, during the late 1760s, there was a prospect of famine, and there were few settlers, poor roads, no water power, little meat, and poverty throughout the region. The family settled in the Waxhaw District along 12 Mile Creek and what became the border of North and South Carolina. The settlement had less than 1,000 people. The most accurate description depicts the area as having 120 families, which historians have calculated to mean between 600 and 700 residents in 1768. By 1775, the land owning population was 933. The territory was isolated and families were close. A resident could go 20 miles in any direction from the wax house and see only woods, swamps, and a few roadside houses, many of them hundreds of yards away from the road. Travelers regularly passed through the district on the Camden Road, which connected Charlestown, the capital of the colony, with Virginia and Pennsylvania. After Jackson's father died, his mother went to live with her sisters and their husbands, the Crawfords. Across the border in nearby North Carolina, soon after Jackson's birth in 1767, Jackson's experience in the Waxhaw community shaped his worldview. Recent scholarship has explored the community life in backcountry South Carolina before and during the Revolutionary period. Because Jackson's earliest surviving writing does not appear until he was 12 years old, historians must rely on indirect evidence to reconstruct Jackson's childhood. The Waxhaw's community during Jackson's early growth was wary of the Cherokees to the West. The community also grew close to the Catawbas, living beside them following the Cherokee War of 1759 and 1761. The leaders of the Waxhaws, 96 and Long Cane, all backcountry settlements of South Carolina shared a common experience in the Cherokee War as protectors of women and children. The South Carolina Gazette reported that a band of roughly 100 Cherokee, Cherokees attacked backcountry settlers, killing or capturing 40 most of them women and children. Nine of the children wandered through the woods after being cut up by tomahawks. Oh, man. The South Carolina government could not react quickly enough as every hour brought to Charleston accounts of ravages, depredations, scalpings, and ruin at the hands of the Cherokees. The British government tried to preempt any further conflict between colonists and Indians by issuing the Proclamation of 1763 it stated that it is just and reasonable and essential to our interests and the security of our colonies that several nations or tribes of Indians with whom we are connected and who live under our protection should not be molested or disturbed in the possession of such parts of our dominions and territories as not having been ceded to our purchased by us are reserved to them as their hunting grounds. In the proclamation, Britain declared itself the protector of the Indians while claiming sovereignty and having dominion over them. Also, the British government warned the colonists against purchasing or settling on Indian land without approval of the mother country. The proclamation line prevented colonists from westward movement and settlements in Cherokee lands. It provided a legal barrier between the colonists and Indians and was intended to protect South Carolina. Before the Cherokee War, South Carolina's policy was to increase European settlers to counter the Indians, offset the slave population, trade with the Indians, and use the trading relationships to form military alliances with the Indians. 
The proclamation line made the back country safe enough to attract new settlers, serve as a buffer between the Carolinas and the Indians, and shut off a western escape route for South Carolina's huge slave population. South Carolina, right? Where they were enslaving so many Indians, more Indians, more, more slaves were being exported out of South Carolina than imported. This is all history, guys. Remember the videos we've done. What slave population? We're just talking about indentured servants and American Indians. That's your slave population. South Carolina also offered free land, tax exemptions, free tools, and payment for the transatlantic voyage to encourage Irish Protestants, who's the Protestants like the Jackson family, to settle the back country. The rising numbers of immigrants in South Carolina was evident in the numbers of grants and acres issued since the mid-1700s. In 1745, South Carolina issued only 65 land grants for a total of 17,325 acres. In 1760, in the middle of the Cherokee War, there were 170 grants, a decline over 35% from 1755. Although the total acres, 43,984, were roughly the same. By 1765, however, there were 942 grants and 208,877 acres. This was over a 500% increase after 1760. The increase continued in 1770 with 1,064 grants and 264,010 acres. The boom in immigration and land grants following the Cherokee War was evidence of South Carolina's continuing policy of establishing immigrants to keep the Cherokees away from South Carolina and to prevent the slaves from escaping to Cherokee land. The Catawbas joined the residents of the Waxhaws to accomplish both goals. British and American victory in the Cherokee War allowed a large land acquisition from that tribe. On December 18, 1761, a treaty between the Cherokees and South Carolina officially ended hostilities and was supposed to have established a boundary between the Cherokees and the Europeans. The Carolinians, however, did not establish the line until 1766. Now remember that in the so-called Cherokees, there's also many Europeans, Sephardi Jews, all these people. Let's not forget the previous research we've done. A lot of Irish, all that. The Carolinians, however, did not, okay, sorry. Although South Carolina increased its land holdings, as a result of this treaty, the colonial government restricted private citizens from interfering with Indian land because great resentments and animosities had been created between the Cherokees and South Carolinians. The South Carolina legislature prohibited citizens from purchasing or in any way acquiring Cherokee land on their own. This restriction of citizen purchase of land was a source of contention for backcountry Carolinians, not only between the colonists, and Indians, but also between the colonists and their government. Some Carolinians also feared that the Cherokees would trigger slave uprisings. The fear of a slave rebellion with Cherokee assistance was not new for the Carolinians. The danger united the otherwise hostile Anglicans and Presbyterians of South Carolina, as the slaves were deemed an internal enemy, rising in numbers daily, with the potential to bring the Europeans one common death or the settlers. As early as 1708, the slave population of South Carolina surpassed that of the settlers, reaching a total of 4,100. By 1720, British merchants, who's the merchants, sold 1,000 slaves to South Carolina annually. Now, guys, remember my slave, uh, the real slave trade videos and all my slavery videos? At this time, who were the uh, so-called whites or the settlers uh, enslaving or these British merchants enslaving in South Carolina? We went over this massively. We've shown the document. It wasn't Africans. In 1765, South Carolina imported more than 8,000 slaves. By 1769, the slave population of South Carolina was 80,000 and the settler population was only 45,000. The Cherokees were notorious even before the war for inviting slaves to come to Cherokee country by promising them freedom. At the beginning of the Cherokee War, Governor James Glenn of South Carolina warned that whatever danger threatens Carolina, 
from the Indians, they are greatly increased by the number of Negro slaves there, whose behavior of late has been seditious. Again, they're saying Negro slaves and all that. <laughs> the black Europeans, you know, the indentured servants, a lot of the Indians were so-called black or so-called Negro. So don't just assume they're talking about Africans, guys. I hate to have to repeat this uh, over and over. But this article adds a lot of hijack because it's written in modern times with the whole out of Africa theories. They will undoubtedly be invited by the Indians to join them and will be incited to it by the hopes of liberty. They are the Indians, many of them. In response to the growing number of slaves, the South Carolina legislature began to restrict the importation of slaves because of the most dangerous consequence of the growing number of slaves, the legislature, in an attempt to obviate the danger, passed an additional duty upon them as to totally prevent the evils. The tax to discourage the importation of slaves to South Carolina went into effect in 1766. Listen, they ain't importing slaves. Remember, more slaves got exported out of South Carolina than imported, especially during this time. So, that went into effect 1766 at a time when South Carolina was actively encouraging white or settler immigration, European immigration of free or Protestants. There you go. Who's the Protestants? Such as the Jackson family. And these are supposed to be all hell skin people. We already know. We broke, we broke that down. We dodged the hijack. We debunked that. South Carolinians recruited Catabas. So the settlers recruited Catabas to counter the dangers of the Cherokees. In late 1765, the year that Jacksons arrived in South Carolina, the governor of South Carolina invited Catawbas to hunt runaway slaves. The Catawbas succeeded in capturing slaves by the terror in their name, their diligence, and singular sagacity in pursuing enemies. The slaves chose to surrender and return to their duty rather than expose themselves to the attack of an enemy so dreaded and so difficult to be resisted or evaded. The governor rewarded the Catawbas for their work. The next year in 1766, the South Carolina's governor hired the Catawbas to hunt runaway slaves who were rumored to be planning an insurrection. Although the Cherokees enticed the slaves to run away, the Catawbas frightened the slaves. The slaves feared falling into the hands of the Catawbas as there was a natural dislike and antipathy between slaves and Catawbas. The Jackson's new home in the Waxhaw community included other disruptive Scotch-Irish immigrants nearby the powerful Cherokee Nation. Charles Wood Mason, an Anglican minister, noted the potential for clashing civilizations because just 30 miles from the Cherokees' best hunting grounds was an area populated by a set of the most lowest, vilest, crew-breathing Scotch-Irish Presbyterians. Listen, from the north of Ireland. Who had built a meeting house, the Waxhaw Presbyterian Meeting House, and have a pastor, a Scotsman, William Richardson among them. These Scotch Irish immigrants, to whom Woods Mason referred in the Waxhaws, included the Jacksons and Crawfords. The land, according to the Anglican minister, was a tract of land being most surprisingly thick settled beyond any spot in England of its extent. While the Cherokees' hunting land was only 30 miles away, the colonial seat of government, Charlestown, was 150 miles away. Charlotte, the con county seat of Mecklenburg County, North Carolina, was only 20 miles away. People in the Waxhaws, thus, were more likely to conduct legal transactions and other business in Charlotte, North Carolina, along with the land, transactions, and other legal business than in Charleston, South Carolina. Because of the distance travel difficulty, and weak government administration, the Presbyterian Church in the Waxhaw Settlement was more important in many civic and social functions than the provincial administration. The Presbyterian congregation oversaw morals and standards of conduct, settled disputes between and among its members, and monitored daily conduct of individuals. The minister of the Waxhaw Presbyterian Church, William Richardson, was perhaps the most well-respected man in the community. Richardson left his books along with money to complete an education at Princeton to William Richardson Davy, who was a Revolutionary War hero and Jackson's mentor. 
As a missionary to the Cherokees, the frustrated Richardson said, though never much inclined, now they, the Cherokees, show the greatest indifference to Christianity. Not only were the Cherokees hostile to Richardson's religious message, they took up arms against the colonists through the instigation of the French. So listen, first they were allying with the French, then eventually they became cool with the British. After experiencing hunger, fever, exposure, and delays and disappointment with the angry and unreceptive Cherokee audience, left his Cherokee mission and came to the Waxhaws to evangelize the Catawbas in 1759. Parson Richardson, who baptized Jackson, evaluated the education and morals and oversaw the learning of the catechism by all the young boys in the Waxhaws from 1759 to his death in 1771. Religion was of high importance to the Waxhaw settlers, particular to Jackson's Peel's Presbyterian mother, Betty. All right, on Betty, huh? She wanted him to become a minister like Richardson. Betty made sure that young Andrew attended church at the meeting house, which was four miles away from the Crawford House, Jackson's residence. Every Sunday and on Saturdays, as well on communi communion weekends, it was seldom that less than 1,200 people assembled at the church on Sunday. From that estimate, combined with other population estimates of the Waxhaws, every Presbyterian in the community, plus many outside of Jackson's hometown, most attended services at the church every week. In the back country, there was the usual combination of devotion to Christianity with a failure to adhere to Christian teaching. Nearly every child in the Waxhaws had to memorize the Westminster Catechism, a series of 107 questions and answers summarizing Orthodox Christian doctrine. The culture of oral tradition required memorization skills and the use of repetition to secure knowledge. Although parents were expected to teach the catechism, the local minister or an elder of the church visited with the children and kept a record of their intellectual and spiritual progress. Poorly trained sons and daughters reflected on the heavenly and civic responsibility of the parents. Although the church enforced these educational and spiritual requirements, by the 1770s, complaints appeared that the Ulster Presbyterian immigrants were losing religion and had turned to drunkenness profane swearing and Sabbath breaking and had become idle, worthless, and rowdy. All right. Remember, a lot of these Protestants are crypto Jews, crypto Muslims. Right? Let's not forget all the research we've done. His mother and minister may have forced the boy to learn the Westminster Catechism, but he quickly turned to profanity, gambling, and drinking whiskey. The first surviving letter from young Jackson describes how best to feed a young rooster implying that he was preparing it for cockfighting. Growing up in the Waxhaws, Jackson learned to fear both God and the Cherokees. He also witnessed the alliance between settlers and Catawbas. His formative years along the Carolinas border shaped his view of the world. Jackson learned that although the Cherokees were a threat along the border, the Catawbas and Waxhaw residents were allies. Cherokee alliance with the French led to distrust of the tribe in South Carolina's during Jackson's childhood. However, because of their strength, the colonists needed peace with their Western neighbors for security. This is why they made friends with them, because they wanted security, not because they wanted to. The Catawbas, though less powerful than the Cherokees, proved a faithful ally by the 1760s within the Waxhaw community. Continuing, it says here, Catawbas, Cherokees, and the Waxhaws. From the time of Jackson's birth, through the revolution, he and the Waxhaw community had contact with both Catawbas and Cherokees. As a result of the first Cherokee War, Carolinians had first gained an ally among the Catawbas. This alliance continued from the mid-1760s to the American Revolution. The Catawba population had steadily decreased throughout the 1700s, as did its military strength. Falling from 1,500 Catawba warriors in 1700, to 240 in 1755. So guys, look, when they're supposedly allying was after 1759 when they converted them, right? So by that time, most of the Catawba, the real ones, all the warriors, all their leaders, they, they had been depleted. These people were kind of like at the mercy too, at the settlers, and you know they just wanted peace and be able to survive. And, and they wanted some allies against 
their enemies the Cherokees. So it's not like, oh yeah, let's 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 hook up with the settlers, let's betray the other nations. You know, remember my slave trade video? Remember all the different tribes that were enslaving other tribes and selling them to the settlers, you know, their allies. This was the thing that was going on. A lot of the times for the tribe for specific tribes own survival, they had to a lot of times make alliances with these settlers. And remember, a lot of these settlers are black folks and just indentured servants, poor people, just trying to make and survive themselves, make it here in the Americas. In comparison, in 1755, there was an estimated 2,390 Cherokee warriors to the west of the Waxhaws. All right, so they had warriors. By the time of Jackson's birth in Lancaster, South Carolina, the Catawbas occupied a 15 square mile tract of land a few miles away. Stratton the Catawba River in today's Lancaster and George counties in South Carolina. Because of their location and declining population, they frequently offered assistance to the British and later during the revolution to the Americans. Since the 1750s, they had helped the colonists fight against the French and their allies, the Cherokees. Now, when they say the French, they mean the Huguenots in this area, guys. They mean Huguenots, same thing. Protestants, you know, they're still fighting Protestants. <laughs> They readily offered the support so long as the British and Americans guaranteed protection of Catawba land in South Carolina. That was the deal. Yeah, you know, you guys keep us safe, keep our land safe. With the Catawbas, as with other tribes, however, the British and the American often broke their promises. See, they always broke their promises. In the mid-1750s, there were 500 settler families living in Catawba lands along the North Carolina, South Carolina border. And although both colonies forbade the white settlement, neither colony aggressively tried to end the settlements. South Carolina law, for example, prevented whites from living within 30 miles of Catawba land, though this was not well enforced, all right? So they mean Europeans. The Catawba nation was composed of several other refugee and minority Indian tribes. So the Catawba nation had other uh, tribes. A lot of those were still suing they were still related to them many of these tribes came into the Catawba nation following a war some had moved into Catawba land because they found strength and shelter among the friendly Catawbas remember these are friendly tribes still others moved there for strength through alliance the Catawbas welcomed these tribes into their nation to replenish their declining population twice in 1738 and 1759 sat by outbreaks of smallpox. Other tribes also consistently threatened the Catawbas. The addition of the smaller tribes bolstered Catawba's strength and prevented them from fading into obscurity sooner than it, they eventually did. For the Catawbas and the settlers in the Waxhaws, the Cherokees were a major foe during the Jackson's time in the Carolinas. In 1670, the Catawbas fought the Westos, in 1672 and in 1707, they fought the Shawnees. And throughout the 1700s, they were attacked at various times by the Iroquois, Creeks, or Cherokees. The Catawbas constantly getting attacked by these tribes, and the Catawbas in general were more friendlier. In the various wars between Indians and the settlers of the 1600s and 1700s, only once in the Jamasee War of 1715, 1716 that they join Indians to fight against the settlers. The Catawba supported the English in the first major Indian war of South Carolina, the Westo War, and they later helped the British in the Tuscarora War. During the French and Indian War, the British used the Catawbas to fight off the Cherokees, who had allied with the French. So this is before they, the Cherokees actually went and allied with the British after. By the time the Jacksons arrived, as part of the great wave of Scotch-Irish settlers in the Waxhaws, the ranks of the Catawbas were declining in population. Smallpox had decimated the Catawba nation in 1738, as well as the Cherokees. Okay, so by the time they allied with Jackson's people, they, they really had no choice. And the Cherokees, again, who had a much larger population. The Cherokees accused the British of spreading the disease among them and threatened to trade with the French. For the Catawbas, the smallpox epidemic of 1759 was even more severe. 
In December 1759, the South Carolina Gazette reported that smallpox had so raged with great violence among the Catawba Indians that it has carried off near one half the nation. Listen to what they're telling you. Same year, supposedly, they got baptized and joined, you know, the Americans against the British. Same year. That's because their wife, their tribe was almost wiped out. The Catawbas went through a lot, guys. And you don't know these tribes. A lot of you in the Southeast are Catawbas, Saponis. Anybody saying Blackfoot most likely comes from Catawba or Saponi tribes. So there's a whole history you're leaving out of your people. And remember, they were enemies to the Cherokees. They weren't uh, buddy buddies. In addition to those who died because of the disease, there were others who committed suicide because of the illness by throwing themselves into the river. Because of the decline in population, the Catawbas relied upon South Carolina for supplies and protection. Between 1740 and 1760, South Carolina gave them at least 1,972 pounds of powder, 4,016 pounds of bullets, 2,750 flints, and 76 guns. The colony also supplied corn, fearing that the tribe may move to another colony for better supplies and trade. South Carolina continued to furnish the Catawbas with ammunition in exchange for loyalty during the colonial period, even as the British French and Spanish did the same for Western tribes. The governor of South Carolina also delivered commissions to the Catawba leaders, which gave the Indian men credibility among the colonists and allowed them to bargain favorably for their people. A report by the British Board of Trade claimed that the Catawbas were directed entirely by the government of South Carolina. The Catawbas proved a very beneficial ally to the colonists against the Cherokees twice in a span of 20 years all right so you see how they're calling them colonists here not just white this is what i mean they just mean europeans and settlers both black and white the relationship was mutually advantageous the government of north carolina and south carolina allowed the catawba's wide latitude and self policing the degree to which they operated independently of the europeans government shows the trust between the two groups if a colonist was killed or his property stolen, Catawbas were sometimes left alone to investigate the crime and order the offender or offenders to make satisfaction. North Carolina representatives told the Catawbas that when one of your people do any of these things, crimes, we have no remedy but are obliged to apply ourselves to you that the offenders may be punished according to your manner and customs. North Carolina allowed Catawbas to take a vengeance on a settler murderer if the tribe was not satisfied with the result of the colony's jury trial because the North Carolina government said it was better to sacrifice one man than to start a war with its Indian ally. In return, the Catawbas punished their members who wronged the settlers. The tribe executed warriors who, while intoxicated, killed a settler child. So, you know, that's something wrong. You know, that's just murder. So why would they allow that? You know, again, the Catawba are in general good-hearted people friendly Indians. This action was particularly noteworthy as traditional Catawba custom would have excused the warrior's action because of his drunken state of mind. The Catawbas once went after a war party that had killed 16 settlers and occasionally colonists and they punished Cherokee war parties jointly. The Catawbas promised to stand firm together with the colonists against the Cherokees like a large mountain which cannot be moved. Now remember, the Cherokees got their own European allies. It's not like, oh, they're going and fighting Indians only. They're fighting for their survival because the Cherokees were enslaving them and invading them, uh, raiding them for years before that. Carolina colonists and Catawbas also showed mutual respect as they would bury one another's dead when discovering a body from the opposite group. The Catawbas recovered horses and other items stolen from colonists by Cherokees and returned the horses to their rightful owners in North Carolina. So just want to add something here as I'm reading, guys. Just remember, this is a modern article. They leave out a lot. They're saying, you know, these people networked and, and worked together, but they didn't also they also assimilated and amalgamated together. They're mixing together. So it's not like, oh, they just finding somebody's body, oh, let me help the Indian. A lot of the times, this, this has become family. During the Cherokee War, 
1761, which ended not long before the Jacksons arrived in the Waxhaws, the Catawbas joined the colonists as they had close relations with North Carolina, Virginia, and particularly South Carolina. As Chief Hagler said, I look upon the English and ourselves as many good things put into one pocket as brothers that have issued from the one womb. The Catawbas depended on South Carolina for protection against other tribes, particularly the Natchez, Chickasaws, and Cherokees, right? Five civilized tribes. To prove this mutual loyalty, a group of South Carolinians once captured some Natchez Indians who had attacked the Catawbas and had the enemies beheaded, their heads pickled and put in barrels and sent to their Indian allies. When a group of Cherokees kidnapped some of the Catawbas, the friendly tribe's leader wrote to the governor of South Carolina, we leave it to your excellency as we have nobody to see us right rectified but you. Cherokees, however, occupied the western portion of South Carolina and occasionally raided settlements near the Jackson's Waxhaw community in the 1760s. All right, this is what they were doing. This is what Andrew Jackson grew up with in fear of Cherokee raids. That's why he hated the Cherokees later on, guys. We're going to get to that. I hope you guys are starting to see that. There's a whole context and background behind what he did. Tensions were high in the Waxhaws when the Jacksons arrived because of the fear of Cherokee raids. In 1760, Cherokees killed dozens of settlers and captured several more in the Waxhaws community. In 1761, during the French and Indian War, the Cherokees joined the French against the British and the colonists and attacked the settlement again. When the Cherokees attacked, they fought both settlers and Catawbas. Each group was defending its home against the Cherokee invaders. Catawbas recognized their independence their dependence on settlers for support against the Cherokees as early as the 1750s after Cherokees had invaded Catawba land and kidnapped Catawba women. They were raiding, taking their women. Remember, we read this. This is what tribes did in America before Europeans arrived. They had their own form of slavery, wars, conquest with each other. And that's what I was trying to tell you guys. All these tribes weren't just at peace, buddy, buddy with each other. There was wars. There was there was conflict here. You know, there were sides here before the Europeans got, and they used those differences, those wars, those conflicts against us. This is what we're reading right now. The Catawbas then turned to the government of South Carolina for assistance. At the beginning of the Cherokee War of 1759-1761, the Catawbas sent 60 of their 300 warriors to help defeat the French and Cherokees. There were 500 Catawbas living in the Waxhaws at that time. They assisted the Waxhaw residents during the Cherokee War in 1761. Forty of these warriors marched into Cherokee territory on raid with the colonial militia. All right, with the colonial militia, not alone. The Catawbas assured the settlers that they were able and determined to strike our hatchets into the heads of the Cherokees. George Washington operated with the Catawbas in war prior to the Jacksons' arrival in the Waxhaws. 25 Catawbas joined his forces during the French and Indian War. Early in the conflict, Washington knew the importance of having Indian allies. He warned that unless we have Indians to oppose the Indians, we may expect a small success. You hear what he said? George Washington said, unless we have Indians who oppose other Indians, we, we ain't going to be successful. We got to use them against each other. Washington courted both Cherokees and Catawbas, but as the Carolinians learned, the Catawbas were more reliable, more friendlier, more civil. Washington declared that no time should be lost, nor any means omitted to engage all the Catawbas and Cherokees that can possibly be gathered. The South Carolina legislature praised the Catawbas for their help. The people's representative also provided the tribe with money and clothing and built a fort and returned for the Catawba support for the Carolinians against the Cherokees. In the Treaty of Augusta, 1761, Britain guaranteed the Catawbas a 15-square-mile tract of land that lay along the Catawba River in northern South Carolina. The Catawbas claimed but had never been granted a larger circular area, 60 miles across in present-day Lancaster County. However, the tribe received a smaller parcel of land, 
South Carolina officially granted a 15 square mile tract of land to the Catawbas with a law barring settlers from hunting or settling there without Catawba permission. At the end of the French and Indian War, it was apparent that although the British enjoyed the great support from many southern tribes, the Catawbas were more aligned with the colony of South Carolina than with the British Empire. At the Augusta Conference of 1763, British Indian agent John Stewart invited Indians from the Cherokee, Chickasaw, Creek, Choctaw, and Catawba tribes. Of the nearly 1,000 Indians at the conference, only 69 were Catawbas. To further show their low rank among southern tribes, the Catawba leaders were the last to speak at the conference. Stewart said that the Catawbas have an absolute dependence on South Carolina and are inseparably connected with its interests. Now remember, all the history before this, what's happening with the Catawbas, the smallpox, the invasions by original colonizers that were in the area, uh, wars with the Iroquois, the Cherokee, the five civilized tribes, constant wars. By the time all this was happening, they literally had no choice but to join these allies that are fighting other Indians and other Europeans just so they can survive. And they were dependent on South Carolina to help them a little bit since they were the problem initially. They came and settled on their land. Catawba land was huge all over the Carolinas for thousands of years, guys. And you don't know nothing about them. By the 1770s, the Catawbas were much weaker than they had been earlier in the century. One reason for their diminished condition, in addition to the smallpox outbreaks, was their geographical location. The Catawbas lived in the relatively flat land along the North Carolina, South Carolina border. Cherokees, for example, particularly in the overhill towns living in the mountain mountainous regions of the western parts of North and South Carolina into present-day Tennessee, had natural barriers of mountains for protection. Other Indian groups living farther away benefited from distance. The Catawbas, however, remained in territory that was rapidly being settled by whites and were easily attacked by their hostile Indian neighbors, right? This is what I was just saying. They're in a place where they're getting constantly, constant colonists, conquerors, invaders, settlers. Since the, they got there, right? Since the 1600s, beginning all the way 100 years later, before all this is happening, where they're, you know, the Jacksons are there. You know, they're getting attacked by hostile Indian neighbors. They're getting settlers take their land. A lot of stuff is happening to them that led them to ally with certain people. By the time of Jackson's arrival, the Catawbas faced the same Cherokee threat to the West as the settlers of the Waxhaws. Continuing, it says here, Jackson, South Carolina, and the Cherokees. Although the Catawbas living near the Waxhaw colonists were friendly during Jackson's youth, the Cherokees to the West were a constant threat. The Waxhaw community experienced the violence of the Cherokees during the Cherokee War of 1759-1761, just before the Jacksons arrived. This experience shaped the community's view of the Indians and fostered the colonists' anger toward the British for employing the Cherokees up to the point the Americans declared independence. All right? There were four main geographic regions of the Cherokees. During Jackson's childhood, the most familiar were the Lower Town Cherokees. The Lower Town Cherokees occupied western South Carolina and northeastern Georgia, with Keowe as the capital. The Lower Towns generally were more peaceful and sort of buffer between the colonists and the more hostile Cherokees to the west, who often launched the raids against South Carolina. Just before the French and Indian War, the lower town ceded land to the British in South Carolina in exchange for two forts, Fort Prince George near the lower town's capital, Keowe, and Fort Loudoun, or London, near the main capital of the Cherokee Nation, Chota, for the west. In 1768, to define the boundary between South Carolina's white population and the lower towns, the two sides agreed to the Treaty of Hard Labor, but settlers still encroached on Cherokee land. Despite the persistent problem of settlers defined boundaries, the lower towns generally wanted peace at the beginning of the revolution, declaring to South Carolina officials that they were determined to remain neutral in the present contest between Great Britain and the colonies. 
in Western North Carolina, however, there were more militant Cherokees. The middle towns were farther to the west and north than the lower towns. Their capital was at Cowie, near modern-day Franklin, North Carolina. Still more aggressive Cherokee towns to the west were part of the valley towns and the overhill towns. The valley towns occupied what is today the southwestern corner of North Carolina. The capital of the valley towns was Tamotli, which is the current site of Murphy, North Carolina. The most prominent Cherokee foes of Jackson's youth, however, were the overhill towns. While the lower towns wanted peace and even ceded land to the Americans, the overhill towns were the most openly hostile Cherokees toward the Carolinas or the Carolinians. The overhill towns and their descendants produced the most militant faction of the Cherokees, the Chickamaugas, who later separated from the Cherokee nation because they perceived weakness and appeasement in the older Cherokees. The overhill towns were located in eastern Tennessee a source of conflict for South Carolina in Jackson's youth, and an impediment to his settlement in Tennessee as a young adult. The capital of the Overhill Towns and the larger Cherokee nation was Chota. From the Overhill Towns of Chota, Chatuga, Tokua, Tamotli, Tuskegee, Zetico, Chilhowee, Great Telico, Tennessee, Great Island, Coyati, Talasi, and Gutsti, the Cherokees launched raids against colonists in western South Carolina and North Carolina. These towns were the source of aggression against the Americans and the victim of American attacks during the Cherokee War. As early as the 1750s, South Carolina recognized the importance of having stability on its northwestern frontier through peace with Cherokees. Governor James Glenn referred to the Cherokees as the key of Carolina because from Cherokee County, or country, sorry, may be made frequent incursions almost without any possibility to restrain them, and they may cut off a number of families in the western part of South Carolina. The British colonial government and the Cherokee Nation made an agreement to live in peace on September 1730, which preserved stability during the mid-1700s. In the British-Cherokee Agreement, the Indians recognized the sovereignty of the English king, agreed to trade with the colonial ruler rather than France or Spain, allowed the English to settle among the Cherokees, agreed to apprehend and return any runaway slaves, and surrender any Indian guilty of killing an Englishman, while the Cherokees had the privilege of living anywhere they please. And the English king ordered his people in Carolina to trade with the Indians and to furnish them with all manners of good that they want. The Articles of Agreement, also known as the Articles of Friendship and Commerce, bound the Cherokees to the British for 50 years. All right. Isn't that something to do with the treaty with Morocco? Huh? <laughs> In young Andrew Jackson's time, according to the South Carolina Gazette, the Cherokees were far more numerous than the Indian nations farther to the north as the Cherokees were commuted to be three times the number of six nations together remember cherokees guys i'm gonna keep saying it to you guys we've gone over the info it was like a confederation of different peoples different indians you know some creeks some of them are iroquois a lot of sephardic a lot of settlers from the 1500s spaniards you know moors sephardic jews that had settled got lost supposedly roanoke right the lost colony all these people a lot of these people became a part of the cherokees you know, a lot of runaways, both Indians and indentured servants, joined the Cherokees. You guys heard earlier, we were reading how Cherokee country was a place where slaves can go. So remember, slaves were also Europeans, not just Indians. We ain't just talking about Africans here. The Reverend Charles Woods Mason, an Anglican minister in South Carolina backcountry, said that when people met at the tavern, they discussed business whether in politics or complained about poor crops or the Indian menace as they gambled at cards or dice. Wood Mason, invited by the Jackson's Presbyterian minister, William J Richardson, to speak, urged the Presbyterians and Anglicans to stand in unity, be it only against the dangers to our lives and properties as may arise from the Indians, whom the Anglican leader referred to as an external enemy near at hand. Even before the Cherokee War, 1759, 1761 began, 
the Cherokees had terrorized the frontier settlers, all right, and also the Catawbas. During the French and Indian War, a Cherokee man named Savannah Tom at Talico murdered a pregnant settler woman in South Carolina in a gruesome way as he executed his inhuman, cruel, and barbarous will on her body by stabbing her several times with a knife, scalping and opening her belly, and taking out a poor infant creature that she had in her body. All right, you guys hear what this Cherokee was doing? Although Carolinians feared Cherokee raids, these fears intensified in 1759 as the Cherokees declared war on the colonists. This war began as the Cherokees, who were allies of the British at first, during the French and Indian War, took stray horses from Virginians as well as food from their smokehouses and storage cellars. The Cherokees thought that because they were allies of the colonists, the Virginians should allow them to take the horses and food. The colonists, however, were angry about the theft and retaliated by killing 24 Cherokees who they thought were raiders rather than allies. This tragic misunderstanding led to the Cherokee War of 1759-1761 and a series of retaliatory attacks or horrid atrocities, as Alexander termed them, committed by the Cherokees against the Carolina frontier settlers. All right, listen. Virginia Governor Robert DeWitty sent gifts and apologies to the Cherokee Nation, but the Cherokee chiefs harbored resentment. Cherokee Chief Ataku Lakula, or Little Carpenter, informed Captain Raymond Demir that the Cherokees will no longer serve as Virginia's allies. Are we not your friends anymore? But they were friends, right? Cherokee warriors then raided Virginia and North Carolina on their way home burning settlers cabins while scalping women and helpless children along the frontier remember this ain't just white folks they are scalping these are a lot of black europeans right and a lot of these cherokees are mixed with sephardic or european a lot of them have european blood they're not just indian so there's a lot of things to take into context when all this is happening and when we're trying to pick sides now in modern times there's a lot of stuff we need to understand Although Atacula Kula apologized to the window for the actions of the warriors, he allowed them to host scalps, dances, riotous celebrations upon their return from the settlement they had ravished in Keowee and lower towns of the Cherokee Nation in western South Carolina. In 1759, Cherokee warriors launched a retaliatory raid on the back country and murdered 24 settlers in return for the 24 Cherokee Cherokees whom the Virginians had killed. South Carolina Governor William Henry Littleton demanded that the Cherokees turn over the assassins. Atacula Kula gave three warriors to South Carolina officials, but immediately thereafter more Cherokee warriors murdered 30 to 40 families who lived in the Long Cane Settlement of South Carolina. At the heart of this violence was the issue that remained in contention for the next several decades, territory. In one episode, after murdering some settler men at Fort Lodon, Cherokee warriors filled a dead settler's man's mouth with dirt, exclaiming, you dog, since you so greedy of earth, be satisfied and gorged with it. Huh. The new immigrants to America came for land, and the Cherokees were looking to preserve their land claims. From the time of Jackson's arrival in America to the Revolution, Carolinians competed with Cherokees for land. Again, this is all Catawba land they're fighting for, right? They're not, this is what they're leaving out. So the settlers are coming into Catawba land and the Cherokees are trying to occupy this Catawba land. They're trying to take it from them. The Catawbas gained an ally in the wax house to preserve their land, but the Cherokees turned to Britain for protection. Jackson, the wax house residents, and the Catawbas joined the Patriot cause while the Cherokees joined the Tories and the British during the American Revolution, all right? People picking sides and allying with certain people, right? So we continue in the article. It says, Jackson, the British, and the Indians during the Imperial Crisis of 1776. At the start of the American War for Independence in South Carolina, Jackson, his family, and the Waxhaw settlement feared a two-front war with both the invading British army and any or all of the potential Indian allies of the British. Cherokees, 
Creeks, Chickasaws, and Choctaws, all right? Five civilized tribes, right? Fortunately for Jackson and the people of the Waxhaws, the Catawbas, unlike the Indians of the West, remained loyal to the Americans during these crucial war years, right? So-called Americans, right? Now, a lot of these are mixed with Indians. A lot of those are straight Europeans, but they're being called the Americans, right? So who's the Catawbas? They're not Americans. <laughs> According to the Catawbas, joined the Americans. Sorry. Accordingly, the Catawbas joined the Americans during the revolution and helped fight the Cherokees to the West, the Tories at home, and the invading British armies. Jackson's family had reasons for distrusting the British years before the American Revolution. Jackson's mother, Elizabeth, or Betty, right, told him as a child, of how when Jackson Sr. was a boy in Ireland, the British threatened to shut the Jackson's Presbyterian place of worship since a rancorous spirit of intolerance and persecution all right, existed among the Jackson family as political and religious enemies of the British. So obviously the British are with the Catholics at that point or in these times when they're fighting people like the Jacksons or you know, other uh, Presbyterians or Protestants. Jackson's mother sang songs to her children of the terror of the British siege of Carrick Fergus in Ireland with its drunken soldiers and their midnight plunderings and the terror left upon the Jackson family. So again, this is all happening before, you know, these so-called settlers and Europeans, these so-called white people, right? They're not all white coming to the Americas. They're going through their own drama, trauma in, the, in Europe before they're coming. They're dealing with British in Ireland before they left, then they come to America and they have to deal with other uh, factions and wars and, uh, you know, political unrest. So not all these Europeans are colonists. Not all of them came, you know, you know, just rich and, you know, they had a happy life. You know, they, they're going through struggle too, guys, you know. During these years, he told them how the Irish nobility oppressed the poor laborers and how they should defend and support the rights of man against British oppression. During the years preceding the revolution, in addition to the immediate harm the British brought to Jackson's world, they also induced paranoia and fear because of the possibility of Indian tax. Both Britain and America were negotiating with the four major tribes of the American South, Cherokee, Creek, Chickasaw, and Choctaw. Each country also competed for the loyalty of the Indian tribe in the Waxhaw settlement, the Catawba. Leading up to independence, the colonists were wary of British attempts to use both Indians and slaves against the colonists. Before the Declaration of Independence in 1775, Thomas Jeremiah, a free black, oh, a free black, was hanged and burned after he was accused of conspiring with the British Navy to distribute arms in South Carolina. All right. It wasn't because he was a slave that he was hanged. It's because they caught him, you know, conspiring with the British. Navy, Thomas Jeremiah, free black. That doesn't mean he might not be European. That might that doesn't mean he might not be part Indian. And that doesn't mean he's African just because they call him a free black. Black is a crayon color. Free people of color during these times. I'm going to show you all of um, Chris Brown's. I've shown you his dad's side. I'm going to show you his mom's side, how many free blacks he had all the way up into these times right here we're reading about. Still on the eve of independence, for Jackson and the people of the Waxhaws, the Cherokees initially were the greatest threat. Britain, led by Agent John Stewart, recruited the Cherokees, Creeks, Chickasaws, and Choctaws. In 1775, Whigs of South Carolina formed an Indian department of their own to counter Stewart's efforts among the Indians. But the leader of this group, William Henry Drayton, was not as successful as Stewart and the British at recruiting Indians. Before independence, Stewart recognized the problems were looming with the Cherokees. Though the Western Cherokees were always more militant, those to the East faced the choice of joining the more aggressive overhill towns or succumbing to settler expansion with a rapidly increasing immigrant population during the late 1760s and early 1770s. A lot of indentured servants coming in. Stewart understood that the extension of our boundaries into the Indian hunting grounds has rendered what the Indians reserved to themselves on this side, the ridge of mountains, of very little use to them. The deer having left those lands, frightened by the numberless white hunters and the settlements so near them, 
the British colonists considered lands not occupied by Indian towns vacant, but the Cherokees thought that the land 30 miles to the west of Jackson's Waxhaw District was their best hunting land. By 1775, rumors circulated in South Carolina that British agent Stewart had ordered the Cherokees and Catawbas to attack the settlers of the back country. Carolina revolutionaries attempted to gain allegiance from the Creeks and Cherokees, but the Tory opposition intercepted the weapons. Whigs then attacked the Tories, who were on Cherokee land in violation of the proclamation of 1763. During 1775, it was apparent that the Indians to the West, particularly the Cherokees, had chosen to join the British as the conflict escalated between the settlers. The British, after all, had made a legitimate attempt to stop settler encroachment of Cherokee lands with the proclamation of 1763. Now, when they're saying Cherokee lands, were these Cherokees always there? Was that always Cherokee land since ancient times? This is a whole topic, you know, that I've discussed a lot. A lot of people know these, a lot of these people are just confederated and seem to have formed in the 1700s, literally. Show me the history of the Cherokees in the 1600s or before that, 1500s, even when the, the Spaniards were arriving. Show me that. In 1775, the men of the Waxhaws recognized the British Cherokee Alliance and went west into Cherokee territory to subdue Cherokees and their Tory allies. The royal governor, fearing mob violence, had been escorted out of Charleston by a ship suspiciously named Cherokee. By the spring of 1775, a majority of southern and northern Indians supported the British. Affirming their support of the crown, Cherokee leaders told British agent Alexander Cameron that they would die in defense of the British. Stuart Cameron urged patience on the part of the Cherokees and although grateful for their support, were hesitant to use the assassins' allies before the Americans declared independence. Stuart, knowing that most of the Southern Indians were loyal to him, realized that the best way to ensure the loyalty was to supply the Indians. Since 1775, the Americans also were competing with the British for Indian allegiance. Speaking to Creeks and Cherokees, Stuart said that he would support such of His Majesty's faithful subjects as may have already taken or shall hereafter take arms to resist the lawless oppression of the rebels and their attempts to overthrow the constitution and oppose his majesty's authority. The British were better positioned with more resources to purchase the loyalty of the king's faithful subjects. While the Cherokees joined the British early and remained allies throughout the revolution, the Catawba sided with the colonists. Initially, they had hoped to remain neutral. A week before the skirmishes at Lexington and Concord set off the military phase of the American Revolution, the Catawbas assured the British that they wished to live amongst the settler people in peace and unanimity. And despite having offers, which appeared advantageous from other nations, the Catawbas declined them because their love for the settler people made us want to continue to live in peace among the settlers. And remember, these people are just like the Cherokees are assimilating, amalgamating with the British and all these other people, the Catawbas are also assimilating. It's not just their friends. A lot of the time has become family. The Catawbas sent delegates to Charleston to inquire about the possibility of war and the South Carolina leadership reassured them that your case and our case is just the same. As one historian of South Carolina concluded, the Catawba loyalty to the colony was never any question. South Carolina Councilman William Henry Drayton told the Catawba representatives that he did not believe the bad talk among some settlers that the Catawbas may join the British and attack the back country. Throughout the summer of 1775, Catawbas and South Carolinians reassured one another that they would remain allies in the conflict. In July, the South Carolina Council of Safety thanked Joseph Kershaw, the American representative to the Catawbas, for his work in procuring military support from the Catawbas and informing the council that the Indian allies were hardy in the interests of the Whigs. In August 1775, the revolutionary leaders fully expected that the Catawba warriors would join the Patriot cause. 
by the fall of 1775, it was clear that the Americans had Catawba's support despite other Indian nations joining the British and the Catawbas fulfilled their promise of support throughout the conflict. Even British agent John Stewart knew, as Tory leader Tarleton would later, learn later, that the Catawbas would not leave the Americans. Stewart said that the Catawbas had been practiced upon and seduced by the inhabitants with whom they now live. Seduced. The inhabitants to whom Stewart referred were Jackson and his neighbors and the Waxhaws. The primary role of the Catawbas early in the war was to capture runaway slaves, particularly during 1775 and 1776. Many slaves tried to escape from the low country through the back country and into safety in Cherokee territory or with the British or Tory support. Just like slaves were running away and going into Florida, right? Some of them going into the Seminoles. This is all part of those five civilized tribes, right? And I've been trying to tell you guys, you got to open your mind, you got to let go, not take anything personal. When I say that a lot of these so-called slaves were indentured serving Europeans running away. I've shown the history. And these same people, a lot of them joined these Indian tribes, the Cherokees, the Seminole, Catawbas, all of them. Creeks, Chickasaw, right? Chocta. In December 1775, the 54 Catawba warriors joined the Whigs as they attacked Sullivan's Island, where 500 fugitive slaves were waiting to board British ships. The combined force of Patriots and their Catawba allies killed 50 blacks and captured other slaves in British, though 20 blacks escaped to be rescued by the British. Now, guys, it says blacks. That doesn't describe people. The footnote says 269. I bet you if you go to the footnote, it says here, Puka, right? I bet you it's not going to say, like, when it's saying, it doesn't say African, it doesn't prove any of these people are African or, or separate them the way they're separating them here, the way they're describing it. And so they put a reference and you got to go check the reference to see exactly what it's saying, guys. You got to always follow up. I've already done that. I've already done that homework. So I already know to dodge the hijack when you hear these things. The Catawbas went to serve alongside the men of the Waxhaws and others throughout the South Carolina backcountry and Western North Carolina. Catawbas took part in some of the same battles as young Jackson and his brothers, most notably at Rocky Mount, Stono, Hanging Rock, Jodkin River against Charles Cornwallis and under Nathaniel Green at Guilford, Courthouse and Haw River. According to the leading scholar of the Catawbas, their service in the American Revolution was the capstone of their adjustment to the new American world and the cornerstone of their ability to endure in that world for the next two centuries. It was the nation's finest performance. While the Catawbas assured the South Carolinians of alliance, the Indians to the West allied and pinned their hopes on each other and the British in 1776. The British tried to stop the Western encroachment by whites into Indian lands since the proclamation of 1763, but the colonists had repeatedly ignored the boundary, driving the Western Indians into alliances with one another and the British as they fought the colonists. In early 1776, the Cherokees, led by Dragon Canoe, informed the British that the primary reason they opposed the Americans was because of the repeated white encroachments of Cherokee land, despite numerous treaties and concessions. The Cherokees also felt that local settlers had cheated them in trade and were generally duplicitous in negotiations. The violence that erupted in 1776 was the culmination of many events that had built up since the end of the Cherokee War of 1761. The Cherokees resisted settler encroachment of land, curtailment of trade, and the settlers' unfair trading practices. In addition, the militant Dragon Canoe replaced older Cherokees, leading to confrontations with the colonists, Indian alliances, and increasing British supplies and encouragement. In May of 1776, the Ottawa, Shawnee, Delaware, and other nations sent delegations to the overhill town of Chota to meet with the Cherokees to discuss an alliance who the Lenape, Delaware, Ottawa, and the Shawnee Look at the, the, the tribe that are aligned with each other, guys, against Catawbas, right? Not just Americans, but against Catawbas. They painted themselves black and painted the post of the 
Town Red and Black, traditional symbol for the preparation of war. This meeting before the Americans had declared independence confirmed an impending assault on the American settlers. Added to this was the fact that agents Stuart and Alexander were purchasing loyalty from these same Indians who later attacked Jackson's homeland. The Cherokees led this meeting, but other Indian alliances were forming at the same time. The Chickamaugas, the more hostile branch of the Cherokees, entered into numerous discussions and visits with the Shawnees of the North. Just before the Indian meeting at Chota in May 1776, the most militant Cherokee and head of the Chickamaugas, Dragon Canoe, met with British agent John Stewart and his brother Henry Stewart. All right, Stewart, Stewart, right, at Mobile in April 1776 to discuss tensions among the settlers. The Chickamauga leader complained to the Stewarts of settler encroachment onto Cherokee land. The British gave the Cherokees 30 horse loads of ammunition at Mobile and Dragon Canoe along with John Stewart returned to Cherokee land where Stewart noted that nothing was take, talked of but war. The Chinese were also present at the meeting and gave the British officials a war belt in solidarity. As the leading historian of the Chickamauga said, the Chickamauga cooperated completely with the British war effort. Although many tribes were organized against the American independence movement, the Waxhaw community felt that the greatest threat in the South Carolina backcountry came from the Cherokees. The British took advantage of this fear. The Cherokees at the start of the war had a population of between 12,000 and 14,000 with 3,000 of these being warriors. Even so, by spring of 1776, hope of peaceful relations with the Cherokees had been abandoned in South Carolina. The Continental Congress, recognizing the danger of Indian interference in the war, warned the tribes, brothers and friends. Again, brothers and friends. This is a family quarrel between us and old England. You Indians are not concerned in it. We don't wish you to take up the hatchet against the king's troops. We desire you to remain at home and not join either side, but keep the hatchet buried deep. If the king's troop take away our property and destroy us who are of the same blood with themselves, what can you, who are Indians, expect from them afterwards? In response to the Cherokee's attacks of 1776, General Charles Lee, echoing Thomas Jefferson's list of grievances in the Declaration of Independence, blamed Britain for inciting Indian attacks. He warned that the British had inspired the Cherokee effort and that a capital and favorite part of a plan laid down by our enemies is to lay waste provinces, burn the habitations, and mix men, women, and children in one common carnage. By the hand of the Indians, it seems absolutely necessary to crush the evil before it arises to any dangerous height. Speaking directly about the Overhill Cherokees, General Lee insisted that American troops should march into the country of the Overhill Cherokees and make a severe lesson and salutary example of them. The Cherokees again had aroused the anger of the Waxhaws by siding with the enemy for the second time in less than two decades. The threat of Cherokees was more formidable with the help of their Tory and British allies during the later stages of the war by providing a constant danger to the West. The Cherokees posed the possibility of a two-front war of British and Cherokees for the Waxhaws with the threat of loyalists within South Carolina while the men of the Carolina border fought Cherokees. Their hometowns were vulnerable to British attack from the East in one of these British attacks, John Jackson was taken prisoner. Listen, John Jackson, this is way before the whole Indian removal. He was taken prisoner by who? Cherokees and the British. Remember, he's in the Waxa community. He's allies, his friends of the Catabas. Okay? That was the anger. Jackson directed at his British captors was also directed toward the Cherokee allies. The anger directed at the Cherokees and British contrasted sharply with Jackson's recognition that the Catawbas were allies in battle as well as longtime friends, all right? Longtime friends of the Waxhaw community. So Andrew Jackson didn't hate all the Indians, guys. 
all right as you guys can see you know even though we're reading a modern take on it and they add some hijack here and there but when you start going into the primary sources that they're listing on this article and you start reading on them yourself you start seeing a bigger picture you start seeing oh there was more to the story and there's a lot of context that left out of history when it comes to andrew jackson all right so that was the end of the first uh chapter uh in this article guys i'm gonna go ahead and end it right there i want to go ahead and see if we can read all the chapters so i don't want to make these videos too long i'll leave this as part one we're gonna get, finish this article we're gonna get into some other books regarding jackson's childhood there and the wax up community more details we're gonna get different books on that all right i hope you guys enjoyed the reading I hope you guys see that there's a whole history here that doesn't really get explained well in school or to us in certain books. We get one-sided stories and very uh, generalized uh, descriptions of, of these events with no context, all right? Bottom line is there were certain Indians uh, Andrew Jackson was cool with. There's certain Indians he hated, and there was a specific reason why he hated these specific Indians, all right? And that's what I'm trying to break down to you guys we're going to go ahead and continue reading this article in the next parts thanks for tuning in taking the time to hear me out hope you guys have a great day much love and respect pura vida mi gente Hawaii.